Welcome to our ongoing series on axial members. So far we have addressed tension members, failure modes for simple axial compression members, using truss work as a means of increasing the breadth of a column for resisting buckling. And now we're going to talk about moment restrained columns or virendeal columns. So these are mutually braced compression members laced together with moment connected cross members. We sometimes refer to this as a virendeal column or a rigid frame column, which is distinguished from a triangulated truss work column, which was our previous topic. So here we have some columns with four slender vertical members on uh, four corners and then they are welded together to each other with deep enough cross members that those cross members help to hold them vertical at the point of the welds. So these are moment connected joints which are restraining the vertical members to remain vertical at the connection points which is distinguished from the triangulated bracing elements that we talked about previously which actually restrain against lateral movement. These only restrain against lateral movement to the degree that they force the column to stay vertical and it's hard for the column which is pulled back to vertical on a regular basis every time one of these cross members connects. It's very hard for that vertical member to drift very far away from vertical if it's or from uh, for it to sway very much if it's periodically pulled back to vertical. Here's another example. We have the vertical elements on the four corners which are moment connected to these horizontal elements which helps to keep those vertical elements vertical. Um, this is the uh, Seattle Space Needle and again we have elements running that are the primary compression elements and then they are braced with these cross elements that hold them uh, from drifting off of their proper orientation. This is another example. Here we have the two vertical elements that are a part of this tower. They're connected together by these deep horizontals which are moment connected in such a way as to force these things to remain vertical. The uh, World Trade Center <clears throat> was an example. The entire exterior tube was a series of vertical elements welded to horizontal elements that ran across at each floor and in this manner without fully triangulating the facade but using a fairly dense structure with really good sturdy moment connections the stability of the structure was assured. There were no internal shear walls, no concrete walls of in the core, which gave great flexibility in the layout and the design of the building, but turned out to be part of its weakness in that the fireproofing on, those, on the uh, vertical circulation was basically sheetrock. It met code um, as it was prescribed at the time that this building was built. So this shows the structure with that dense uh, tubular structure. Unfortunately, this doesn't show it very well because as you'll notice, uh, these are deep horizontal elements welded in there. But in this diagram, they're sort of depicted like a super thin edge of the floor. But basically, if you look at this wall, you see these really deep horizontals and huge numbers of those verticals uh, moment connected to each other to create an extremely high degree of stability under vertical force. And for that matter, also excellent resistance to horizontal forces. Um, as long as this facade doesn't detach from the floors. But that's what happened basically in this facade, which is very thin and very crucially stabilized by the floors. Once it detached, you began to have a compressive failure uh, that could not be stopped. Uh, this same concept was applied to the Sears Tower. The Sears Tower had much more generous windows, but as a consequence, uh, 
the rigid frame was not quite as rigid. To compensate for that, they ran rigid frames through the building, <clears throat> and those rigid frames created basically a three by three layout of nine tubes uh, where the walls of these tubes were constituted by this kind of rigid frame with these moment connections. Uh, the field connections were made here and here and here and all these joints were welded in the shop. And then you see more field connections right there and right there. So the fundamental unit was basically a vertical with two horizontal crosses on it. And the bolted connections in the field were made there. Um, this tubular concept allowed portions of the building to be dropped off earlier, which uh, changed the cross section as the building went up, which is the people at SOM say, confused or detuned the vortices. And also uh, these tubes were terminated at lengths where the natural frequencies of the tubes tended to suppress each other, which reduced the tendency for any kind of wind-induced oscillations to cause any serious disturbances in this building. Okay, so here we have some um, 16th inch uh, styrene sheet, which has been glued, and it wasn't very well glued because um, the people gluing it didn't realize that the plastic would melt and deform, but basically these two sheets are barely able to hold themselves up and they can't really carry any load. Uh, and you'll notice both of them towards the top are severely tilted over. If we can run a horizontal across the top that's moment connected to each one of them, that horizontal can pull them back to vertical. And that's what you see here, where this horizontal element has been welded to that vertical and to that vertical. So instead of something that's just sort of keeling over near the top, uh, this horizontal is actually pulling it back to vertical and now it's actually able to handle a small amount of load. If we do that periodically, like at this intermediate point, you'll notice there's a huge amount of slope right here, but if we can introduce an element there that will pull it back to the vertical at that point, the lateral movement is drastically reduced and in fact we were able to quadruple the load here by reducing the effective length of this column uh, to half of what it was before. If we do that again, we're able to quadruple the load again, each time reducing the lateral sway or the tilt that's associated at certain points along the vertical member or the originally vertical member that's keeling over under load. If we can pull those maximum slopes back to vertical then the column becomes much stronger. So this demonstrates the principle of a Verandil column or a rigid frame column. This is another example of the basic concept. Here we have no restraint against lateral movement except the column itself, but the column is moment connected at top and bottom, and that has allowed this column uh, to remain vertical here and remain vertical there and it actually functions pretty well as a column. And in fact, this column is essentially the same strength as a pinned pin column with cross bracing. So here's an example of a building that was based on this principle. Here we have no shear walls, no cross bracing anywhere in this building, just a moment connection between these deep trusses and these vertical columns. And you'll notice these columns are fairly stout looking and that's because they are uh, resisting bending influences under wind load and things like that. Um, but they're pretty efficient even then and they give great architectural flexibility because there doesn't need to be any cross bracing internally in this building. So this building is taking off on the same principles as the World Trade Center and the Sears Tower in that it's using moment connected joints, in this case between horizontal trusses and vertical wide flange sections to create the stability 
for the structure. This just shows the uh, predicted strength of various things. Um, one of the things we do is we start looking at a pin-pin column and we say whatever the length of that column is, is the length that appears in the Euler formula. Um, and it turns out that is lambda over 2, where this is a half a wavelength in a sine curve. And if we continued that curve, it would go up and sweep around like that. Um, but we take lambda over 2 as the effective length of the column. If we do um, moment, moment with sway, which is basically what that is, there's nothing to stop the sway, but the moment connections are active in resisting lateral movement. If we do that, we can have sway at the top, in which case this is a half a sine curve because the rest of the sine curve would go down like that. So lambda over 2 is the actual length here. Lambda over 2 is the actual length there. In other words, that column has the same predicted strength as a pin-pin column that's braced against sway. If we not only moment connect at top and bottom, but we inhibit sway with some kind of cross bracing, then this is the buckling pattern, which is a full wavelength. And half of the actual length is lambda over 2. In other words, the effective length of this is half the effective length of that and half of the effective length of that. So we expect this to be four times as strong. So here's a, an example of this kind of column, pinned moment with sway flagpole. So we have a moment connection at the base. We're allowing sway and we're allowing tilt at the top. There's nothing to inhibit it. We call this, the shorthand terminology, is a flagpole column, and this is an example. So here we have a power tower that's moment connected at the base, but there's nothing restraining it against movement at the top and nothing restraining it against tilt. So it's a flagpole. This is the moment connection at the base, which consists of many of these anchor bolts that go deep into this concrete footing. This particular footing is five feet across and goes about 40 or 50 feet down into the ground. The ground is augered out and the concrete fills in and then this column becomes an extension of it. This is a classic example of what Frank Lloyd Wright used to call a taproot model of a column where it's the soil around this thing that keeps it stable. We could also call it the fence post model if you want to, but he referred to the taproot, which certain kinds of trees have as a way of stabilizing themselves. You'll notice on the bottom here, there is a nut, which we call the leveling nut, and then on the top is the so-called locking nut, and this is the classic base for every steel column. It's a steel plate. This steel plate, by the way, is about an inch and a half thick, and the wall of this tube is only a quarter of an inch, and that's because the wall of the tube is acting in pure axial compression or under wind load. Some of it's acting in tension, but this base plate is acting in bending, and, and we worry about stress concentration on these welds, so this base plate needs to be really thick and really stiff. This is an architectural application of a flagpole. Um, these structures are not braced relative to each other. So in other words, there's a slot down the middle between them and they don't touch structurally. And that's why they have an extremely wide base here because they are truly like a tree with a moment connection here or like a flagpole. And, and because they're not connected together, they're not developing any kind of collective rigid frame action. They are true trees and that's why the base is the absolute source of stability. Also trees tend to move a lot and this structure can't be allowed to move because there's glass up here. So the base of these trees is even wider and more rugged than you would see in a really thick sturdy tree. Finally, we can have a table leg model of stability. 
where the moment connection is only at the top and not at the base. So you'll notice we're getting tilt at the base, which is telling us this is acting as a pin joint, but it's coming up vertical at the top, which tells us we have a moment connection up there. And this is a classic example of this. This is a Johnson Wax building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. It has a spindly thin column down at the base. The column gets fat up near the top and there's actually a moment connection to a structure up above which Frank Lloyd Wright has disguised uh, by bringing down this translucent ceiling and providing the illumination above. But in reality there's a very deep beam running across the top in that direction and deep beams running in this direction at every one of these points. So there's a grid of deep beams up above which intersect over the tops of these columns and the columns are moment connected to that grid of beams to provide what we would call a table leg model of stability. And if you removed all of this uh, translucent ceiling, you would see that and you would understand instantly how this is behaving. In Frank Lloyd Wright's case though, he didn't want you to see that. He wanted you to actually have a completely different emotional experience in this space. He wanted you to feel like you were underwater and like you were looking up at lily pads which were levitating or floating. And so he actually wants to disguise all that structure and give you a different sensation, which I think was pretty effective. Uh, my biggest concern with it is there's enough of this dark beam to sort of suggest its presence up there and it would have been nice if that could have been even more effectively disguised. But I think the structure is very effective at doing what he wanted to do. He actually published this image and didn't show any of those beams up above and it created a huge stir because there was a structural engineer who saw it and concluded that Frank Lloyd Wright was insane and that the building was going to collapse on people. So Frank Lloyd Wright commissioned a test of one of these things um, and he had it braced with, with pieces of wood all around and did that test publicly and of course that created even more of a stir because people were saying well none of that bracing exists in the actual building so how can he be using that as part of the testing mechanism but the, the concept was pretty well thought through. Frank Lloyd Wright um, had a gift for, for structure in certain regards, and some of his designs were intuitive and clever. Uh, some of them were really bad also. He had major problems with falling water, which he tried to blame on the contractor, but actually were his fault. He under-reinforced the decking, and it was not thick enough decking and it was a major uh, headache to get that fixed eventually, but they did. Um, and to the very end, he continued to blame it on the builder and actually said the builder had too much steel in the deck, which actually it was the exact opposite. There was not enough steel in the deck. So Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, was one of these people who had extraordinary gifts, but he was also uh, a fairly flawed person in some of the things that he did and so we have to kind of look critically at whatever his claims were uh, but for sure he was good at showmanship and he got a huge amount of publicity out of the testing that was done of this particular structure. <clears throat> okay so here's another table leg here's a deep beam which is moment connected to this vertical element so for example under wind load in this direction um, the moment capacity of this joint becomes active. Um, <clears throat> it's also um, a fact that under gravity load, what holds this thing vertical is its moment connection to that. On the other hand, in this direction, it's an unbelievably weak sort of pin-pin column, and that's why in that direction we have to have cross bracing. So this column is pin-pinned, relative to buckling failure in that direction, but it's table leg relative to buckling failure in this direction. So 
if someone says, is this a table leg or is it a pin pin column? You would have to say, well, it's both. It's pin pinned relative to one mode of failure in one direction and table leg relative to the failure mode in the other direction. <clears throat> this shows the base point, which is basically a pin joint uh, in both directions because it's very narrow base and has a small, only has two bolts holding it. And so you don't get any appreciable moment connection at the base. Uh, here's another structure that's based on the same concept, pin joint, moment joint, major moment joint, pin joint. Um, <clears throat> and this just shows how that joint is put together. And here at the base, you'll notice they even left out one of the bolts, uh, but it's not that crucial because um, basically that's not intended to be a moment joint anyway. And this is a particularly striking example. This is the Pirelli building, but designed by Pierre Luigi Nervi. You'll notice the small base points, the super thick um, moment joints up above, creating the rigid frame. In this case, the rigid frames crisscrossed back and forth through the building, which means they worked not only to stabilize the columns in the in the narrow direction, but also in the long direction of the building. There are also cantilevers out on this side, which basically go out to this curtain wall, which allowed the curtain wall to be absolutely minimal uh, in terms of the mullions, because the mullions have no gravity function and there are no columns of structural columns out at the boundary of the building. That ends our discussion of moment restrained columns, which are mutually braced compression members laced together with moment connecting, moment connected cross members. <clears throat>